Shalomli Paisko, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, dear friends, I hope all of you can uh, hear me uh, without the microphone. I'm afraid that's my idiosyncrasy. I prefer to speak without the microphone if that's possible. Can you all hear me? Um, before we begin, first of all, I would like to express my heartfelt gratitude uh, to the organizers of this conference, in particular my old friend, uh, Professor John Mitzkel, who's sitting up top uh, for inviting me. I'm profoundly moved, I must say, uh, to be present at Warsaw University, in which I spent uh, a good couple of years uh, long ago. And uh, standing here today, it doesn't seem like it was that long ago. Um, so on, on a personal note, it really is a tremendous, a tremendous pleasure, but also a tremendous uh, honor. Uh, we're very fortunate today to have an extraordinary panel uh, to discuss relations between, on the one hand, Israel and the Middle East, and on the other hand, Poland and Central, East Central Europe, uh, countries that have emerged uh, in 1989 and 1990 and regained their places on the map of Europe. I must say, I feel uh, I'm not entirely qualified to discharge the obligation with which I have been uh, tasked because I am not a practitioner of foreign policy uh, and it's often said those who can do those who can't teach and we have uh, in front of us three seasoned ambassadors uh, all of whom have been at various times and one of whom still is a practitioner of international relations of foreign policy uh, on the other hand uh, it has often been said that an ambassador is a person who thinks twice before saying nothing. Uh, but I'm quite sure that today we will discover that that isn't really the case. I've been uh, told, uh, I hope I've been informed correctly, um, that I should uh, spend a few minutes before we begin, before I turn the microphone over to our distinguished panelists, just to say a few words. And unfortunately, in my case, at least if you ask my children, they'll always tell you, uh, Papa never says a few words, he always says a few hundred words, or usually a few thousand words, uh, but I'll try to be brief. A few words about uh, the history of relations between Israel and Poland, which I hope will provide the appropriate, well, context or background to what we're going to hear from our three distinguished panelists. Well, let me say first of all that bilateral relations between Israel and Poland, and of course I don't pretend to be entirely objective on the subject, uh, but nonetheless I would say they can fairly be described as special. Because certainly behind them lies the extraordinary legacy of a thousand years of history of Polish-Jewish coexistence. And I needn't tell you that that history was punctuated by, men, by moments of tremendous uh, triumph, but also of terrible tragedy. And certainly I think most of you are familiar with the fact that for many centuries much, if not most, of world Jewry lived on the territories of what is today present-day Poland, or at least Poland uh, in, its, in its wider borders, uh, which eventually became the heartland of the Zionist movement of Jewish national rebirth and produced many of Israel's greatest and best known luminaries. Influenced by the dramatic rebirth of Poland, some Jews in Poland saw in their native country an inspiring example of national struggle which would one day be emulated in the land of Israel. Now, of course, that story of the Polish-Jewish presence in Poland, for the most part, came to an end when the Germans and Austrians, and you forgive me that I don't use the word Nazis, chose Poland as the killing grounds of local and European Jewry, and Poland became embedded in Jewish consciousness, and we can speak about, later, about that later perhaps, uh, as the epicenter of the Holocaust. But certainly in the years leading up to World War II, the government of Poland had actively supported the creation of a Jewish state in Palestine, above all as a means of fostering Jewish emigration, in other words, to reduce the size of the Jewish population in Poland. And it covertly, I don't know if this is known to you, it covertly aided the Jewish underground movements that struggled against the Arabs and the British. And after the war, it initially, at least initially, continued supporting the Zionist cause. And although Poland found itself in the Soviet orbit after the Second World War, relations with Israel continued right up until 1967. 
And with the outbreak of the Six-Day War, Warsaw followed Moscow's lead and severed relations, though privately many Poles, very contemptuous of Soviet Russia and its Middle Eastern proxies, were gratified that, and I quote, our Jews beat their Arabs. Only at the end of the 1980s, with the onset of Guasnost and the gradual disintegration of communist rule, was Israel able to reestablish its foothold in Poland, which I think we all understand had been a maverick among the so-called, well, people's democracies and the most important country in the region. And by 1990, with the rusted shackles of communism finally shattered, Poland was able to determine its own destiny, including its own foreign policy, which meant a reestablishment of relations with the state of Israel. Now today, more than 25 years later, Poland, we may say, is one of Israel's staunchest allies in Europe. Some would say it's the staunchest ally in Europe. We could discuss that. Uh, a member of NATO and the European Union, Poland is certainly the largest and most successful economy in post-communist Europe. And I would argue with the imminent withdrawal of Great Britain from the European Union, the country's influence in the pan-European organization as leader of the East Central European bloc can be expected to grow still further. I would also add that as a state that traditionally has seen itself as upholding a distinct national identity as a kind of national state, in Poland there is an understanding of, and one might even say an admiration for Israel, uh, which is absent in Western Europe. Uh, nowadays, in other parts of Europe, uh, a kind of national-oriented Weltanschauung, the idea of a nation-state, uh, is generally seen as anachronistic and outmoded. Uh, moreover, and this is an important point, there is no appreciable number of non-indigenous Muslims in Poland, uh, and as a result, it's also been immune to the unrest plaguing many Western European countries. And its friendly policy toward uh, Israel has, for the most part, remained quite constant. Um, but I would say also, and it's important to note, that although Poland has not seen the kind of terrorist outrages, thank God, that have plagued other countries, and those outrages have often been directed at distinctly Jewish targets, that does not mean, however, that nativist anti-Semitism has been eliminated, as anyone who is at all familiar with the broadcasts of Radio Mario will readily testify. And it must be stressed also, and perhaps this is um, a subject for another discussion, that contemporary anti-Semitism in Poland is focused above all on dead Jews rather than live ones, really on the place of Jews in Polish memory. Um, I'm only hinting at that subject, but that's a, a theme perhaps we might touch on uh, during our discussion. It's also important to point out in this context that Polish scholars have been especially active in shedding new light on the history and culture of Polish Jewry. And to their very great credit, I would argue, they have not recoiled from dealing even with the most, well, excruciating aspects of the Polish Jewish past. Uh, I might also say, however, that Poland's history policy, uh, whatever that means, is an irritant that does muddy relations between the two countries, to a greater or lesser extent. I mean, we could discuss that. Today, certainly, there are innumerable professional and people-to-people -people contacts uh, between the two countries in a way that I could tell you, as a student in Poland in the late 1980s, I would not have believed uh, imaginable. Um, I remember very distinctly, and this gentleman who's sitting here to my right, attending the first concert of the Israel Philharmonic Orchestra con conducted by Zubin Meda. I think that was in Warsaw in 1987, if I'm not mistaken, and I remember the sense of exhilaration of the people in the audience that something uh, was happening here. This was something that transcended uh, a mere cultural happening, that Israel was finally, was finally in a position to uh, reach out to Poland and Poland to reach out to, to <coughs> Israel. Certainly the constantly growing tourist traffic between the two countries is facilitated by an increasing number of flights. You may not be aware of this, but today you can get on an airplane in Katowice or in Lublin or in Zeszów and fly directly uh, to Israel. And Polish-Israeli trade has flourished in recent years, and the trade turnover presently stands at over $1 billion. The field of high-tech is also seen as especially promising, and Polish firms are working closely with Israeli startups as they seek to replicate on the Vistula the experience of what in Israel is called the startup 
nation. Cooperation in the military and intelligence spheres has also been particularly intense and fruitful, and Poland is interested in Israel's advanced cybersecurity technology. Um, there's understandable concern uh, that in Israeli and Jewish circles, particularly among the tens of thousands of Israeli high school students who visit Poland every year, that this country will primarily be seen as a place of Jewish suffering and death. I, I'm happy to say uh, that in recent years, many efforts have been made to reveal the face of modern day Poland, not only as a place of Jewish martyrdom, but as a thriving democracy whose people played uh, a major, if not the major role in the struggle to end communism, and of course also as a vast repository of Jewish history and creativity. And as I said, thanks to these low-cost airline flights and direct connections, uh, just as an example, Warsaw has become a popular weekend destination for Israelis, and Poles have also discovered Tel Aviv sandy beaches and fabled nightlife. So we could say that kind of normalization is something that is very positive. Now, I feel uh, I haven't really done entirely what I'm supposed to do because at least ostensibly the topic of our discussion is not merely Poland, but also the other post-communist countries uh, in East Central Europe. <clears throat> I would tell you, and here I am speaking from personal experience, that colleagues in Budapest and Bucharest and in several other Central European capitals can also report on similar developments, particularly as Israelis who have roots in those countries uh, have rediscovered them, and Hungarians, Romanians, Lithuanians, Slovaks, and others have found, uh, after many years of a lack of contact, suddenly a common language with people whose parents and grandparents had once lived beside their own. And that's, of course, uh, something that uh, all of us should find very gratifying. I suspect I have probably spoken, as my sons would have told me, for too long. So without further ado, uh, I would like to turn the microphone over to our panelists, which means I get to uh, get off my feet. You can also hear me even from the sitting position, I hope. So, with your permission, I would like to introduce our first speaker. I think I'd like to introduce her, if I can find her biography. Here we go. And that is Agnieszka Magjak Miszewska. And for those of you who don't know Polish, you will understand, having heard her name, why it's often said that the hardest job in the world is to be the roll call officer in the Polish army. So Agnieszka Magjak Miszewska is a literary philologist, a journalist, and a diplomat. In the 1980s, she was associated with the Catholic intellectual journal Vienge, and she later served as deputy director of the Independent Center for International Studies in Warsaw. Her government postings include stints as consul general in New York and as deputy head of mission in Moscow. She was for five years ambassador in Israel? Uh, Six, almost, six. almost six years uh, as ambassador in Israel, uh, and also served as an advisor on Polish-Jewish relations in the office of the Prime Minister, and was also an advisor to the Minister of National Defense. Ambassador Magjak Miszewska is presently the coordinator of the Roots Project, developed by the journal Vienge, uh, which is devoted to exploring relations between Judaism and Christianity, and if I'm not mistaken, was founded by Ambassador Ronald Lauder, who I'm pleased to acknowledge as well. Okay, okay. okay. Uh, I will use mic. Uh, I don't know if my voice will be so loud as, as Laris. Uh, so if uh, you agree, I will continue for two or three minutes uh, uh, to elaborate the Polish-Israeli relations uh, and my uh, experience from being an ambassador uh, in this beautiful country. And later I would like to uh, elaborate a bit uh, about the uh, Israel and the region. Because uh, the name of the panel is Israel, Middle East, Poland, uh, East Europe. So. I should say that when I came to Israel in 2006, uh, the relations, uh, Polish-Israeli relations, uh, were 
very good thanks to my predecessors. I know that the new beginnings after the fall of communism uh, was very difficult because Poland was absent uh, in this country for uh, many, many years. Uh, our voice, uh, there was no Polish voice in the um, uh, discussions on what has happened uh, during the Second World War uh, on Polish soil. Uh, we, uh, and the situation was that uh, if, let's say, the um, uh, young Israel, the destination uh, of young Israelis, one of the uh, most popular in Europe was Berlin, uh, that wa Warsaw was, uh, let's say, white uh, place on the map. Uh, so this is why perhaps uh, when the, uh, the, the decision of the Polish government was taken to conduct uh, a very special event or the series of events uh, called uh, Polish Year in Israel. Uh, why, I'm, why I'm talking about it? Because, because uh, having numerous and very important uh, declarations, memorandums, uh, the uh, law base for relations between two countries and a very good relations on the governmental level, still, still the public of both countries, but mainly Israeli public, was rather, uh, let's say, in some segments hostile, in some segments relevant to what Poland is. So taking this into account, the, uh, let's say the decision was taken to start the public diplomacy, to, 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 info, uh, to reinforce the public diplomacy. Uh, so the Polish year which took part uh, in 2008 and 2009 was uh, very carefully uh, uh, prepared by uh, almost one year uh, activities. I mean, inviting the uh, very important pe people of Israeli culture, curators, directors of the museums, filmmakers, uh, directors of the theater, directors of the galleries, Invite, uh, to invite them to, and ask them to come to Poland to see the Polish culture, to, to see the Polish uh, cultural life and decide what can be, uh, uh, what can touch the Israeli public. The, the one thing and the second, uh, uh, the, that was also, uh, there were also a lot of common Polish-Israeli project uh, prepared. So I should say that after, after this year, uh, the mood of the public, especially when we are speaking about, uh, I don't know if it's possible to use uh, the word elite now, because it's very un uh, unpopular, uh, but let's say that the public opinion makers, at least, uh, has been changed. And uh, it became a, a very invoke to be invited to Poland to participate in uh, Polish-Israeli projects. And many of Polish artists uh, became very uh, recognizable in the, in the country. This is, uh, this is what I would like to stress, because I should say that as an ambassador in such a uh, Difficult. Uh, on one hand, very friendly country uh, uh, with very friendly government and ministers and agencies, governmental agencies. And on the other, with uh, a lot of uh, difficult experiences, stereotypes and prejudices, uh, I should say that people-to-people -people, uh, policy is probably the best way to make all those beautiful agreements are uh, uh, possible to fulfill, uh, which we have still uh, some problems with it. So this is one thing. The second, um, 
uh, and, uh, I, and I was very, let's say, happy that during my uh, tenure it was uh, possible to upgrade Polish-Israeli uh, uh, political relations to the highest possible level, I mean the G2G, government to government uh, consultations, which are conducted last, uh, was held in uh, November, November last year. So, uh, so this is very difficult as well as uh, military cooperation uh, in, uh, between our countries. I will not elaborate a lot. I should only say that uh, two years or three years ago, that was the first time when uh, Polish and uh, Israeli pilots mixed uh, in the military aircrafts during the safe, uh, safe sky exercise. So this is probably the one of the examples how uh, much trust has been built between between the two 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 military two military bodies, two two pilots and armies. And uh, our and very important thing the uh, common trainings of our special forces as well. Uh, Larry uh, elaborated about the commercial R&D, that's fine. Another thing, uh, and what I would like also to stress, that being an ambassador in Israel is a very uh, unique experience to touch and to feel uh, the country in a very uh, hostile environment. Because despite the peace agreements between uh, uh, Jordan and Israel and Egypt and Israel, uh, the uh, citizens, the people of both countries, are not friendly, uh, have, have not friendly attitudes towards uh, towards uh, towards Israel. So, uh, having especially now because of the uh, Daesh, because uh, of the war in Syria having a very close uh, cooperation with between intelligences of uh, Jordan, Egypt, plus Saudi Arabia and some countries uh, who, are, uh, who, don't, uh, who didn't uh, recognize Israel. Uh, the people-to-people -people relations rather don't exist. And uh, being in, uh, living in such a country is, at my case, uh, uh, in Piotr's uh, much longer than, uh, than me. Uh, and, uh, it's a very specific, uh, very specific and very unique experience when you are realizing how this tiny, tiny country, very small country, uh, being uh, almost every day at the headlines, uh, not very friendly headlines uh, in the world newspapers, how hard uh, its diplomacy have to work uh, to preserve this fragile uh, stability. So I will elaborate about it a little bit later if you are interested and especially how difficult is the Israeli um, um, situation between two uh, Powers. One is global and is a constant ally of uh, Israel, I mean the U USA, and the other which pretends to be a global power uh, and uh, is very important for Israel stability. Also, I mean Russia, taking into account that the million and a half of Russian speaking people living in Israel half of them having double citizenship, and hundreds of thousands of them voting in Russian elections. So I will quit for a moment. Well, first of all, thank you very much. And back to <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I feel also, personally, I have been a little bit remiss because in presenting the ambassador, I presented only a few fragments of her formal curriculum vitae, but I may say in my capacity as the director of the Israel Council on Foreign Relations, I perhaps should send her out of the room because I don't want to cause her to uh, feel any embarrassment in front of this audience that she has done extraordinary things to promote relations between our two countries. And I may say 
she took them to, I could say, dizzying levels. But I think to this day, people remember with uh, tremendous gratitude, not only, of course, her success as a diplomat um, and the vital work that she did, but also her candor in dealing with a society, as she explained very eloquently, had very mixed feelings uh, about the historical relationship between Jews and Poles. And she confronted those feelings uh, with tremendous sincerity and with tremendous candor. And I must say, um, at least in my mind, uh, presented diplomats who find themselves in similar situations uh, with a role model. And uh, however much she did speak about the importance of public diplomacy, uh, she could have spoken about it even more uh, intensively because I think that uh, it really uh, reached a, tr a tremendous level and did a tr great deal. I'm sorry, I have to take this. I think it really did a tremendous amount to diffuse whatever tensions existed between Israel and Poland or between Jewish society in Israel and Poland, and that was not an easy task. Uh, this is a work in progress. It's an ongoing, ongoing project, we can say. And I might also add, and this is my own opinion, relations between Israel and Poland will never be entirely normal. They won't be like relations between two countries in different parts of the world that don't have a common historical heritage and don't always see history in quite the same way. But what she did was to make people understand that though not everybody agrees about every chapter of history, there is enormous goodwill and whatever disagreements do exist, these can be overcome. And therefore, I think that this was a kind of, well, textbook case about r historical reconciliation. And maybe one day that story will be written. Uh, if it is written, it's uh, largely in your hands. But listen, what I would like to do now is we'll move on and we'll save the questions or the discussion at least among ourselves until everybody at least has had a, a first opportunity to speak. Uh, we'll continue now uh, with Piotr Puchta. He is an ambassador at the Polish Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, he has served at various times at the Polish Embassy in Tel Aviv. Uh, in fact, I could say he was a pioneer in establishing relations or re-establishing relations between uh, Poland and Israel at the end of the 1980s. He has also been a representative to the Palestinian Authority in Ramallah. Uh, he later served as Polish ambassador to Egypt and non-resident ambassador to Eritrea and Sudan. And I think I may say, uh, and this is uh, not an exaggeration, he is certainly one of the top experts, not only in this country, but in all of Europe, on Middle Eastern issues and on Polish-Israeli relations. Uh, Piotr, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Oh, actually, may I say one I'm thing? I'm blushing now. Now, you, you have to blush. I want to say something also on a personal note, and this is what you call for full disclosure. Uh, in fact, I know all these three panelists very well. Uh, and for many years about this guy, I will save uh, my comments uh, to when we present him a special message. Uh, but I do remember, and you correct me if I'm mistaken, Piotr, that we actually met, it was in 1994, uh, when a call came to my office that was directed, in fact, uh, to my then chief. And I picked up the telephone, answered the telephone, and this gentleman said, hello, my name is Piotr Puchta in English. I am calling you from the Polish embassy in Tel Aviv. And I said, sir, if you prefer, we can speak in Polish. And so uh, immediately he was a bit surprised, and the rest of the conversation took place in Polish. And I say we've been, I think, good and friends. Piotr said we can uh, speak in Hebrew, yes? Yeah, so he can speak in Hebrew as well, though. He, he, not, not, not always e eager, to, eager to display that, but... Uh, uh, I think we've been friends actually ever since, so this is also a very special pleasure uh, to have you, have you address us. So please, forgive me for cutting you off. Thank you, since uh, we are starting with personal anecdotes, so I would like also uh, to mention uh, two things. First of all, uh, the concert by uh, the orchestra with Zubin Mehta here in Warsaw was preceded by another concert uh, one year before in Tel Aviv by the Chamber of Orchestra with uh, Jerzy Maksymiuk. 
And uh, during this concert, we had uh, a pleasure of uh, uh, witnessing the presence of uh, Isaac Shamir, who at that time was uh, the foreign minister. And uh, this was the, the opening of uh, the Polish office in Tel Aviv. Next day, all the Israeli newspapers uh, brought uh, this news to all the Israeli public and I believe also to many other capitals in the Middle East. Uh, uh, the, other, the other personal anecdote, uh, in fact, uh, uh, Larry and Agnieszka already mentioned that uh, I was the, the first diplomat from Warsaw to arrive to Tel Aviv. Uh, and uh, I would like to confirm here that uh, the, the lack of, of knowledge between uh, and the lack of information between uh, the two countries was striking. Just to give you an example, uh, every diplomat before going to the posting has uh, obligation to, to read the, the recent uh, reports by the embassies in relevant countries. The report that I could read in Warsaw before going to Tel Aviv at the end of the 80s was dated 1967. So this shows uh, the gap that we had at those uh, times uh, between uh, Poland and Israel. But uh, coming back to uh, the topic that uh, uh, we have on our agenda today, um, I believe we should speak uh, about Israel and the Middle East uh, as, as one of uh, uh, the focal points of our conversation. Uh, and I would like uh, just to point the discussion to mention a few topics that I believe are relevant uh, if we are considering the present day position of Israel and uh, the neighboring state in the region. Uh, those uh, major issues are, uh, and uh, I, be I believe that uh, this is something that uh, is obvious to, to many of us here, but uh, I believe it is worthwhile mentioning. Uh, so, according to uh, the recent reports, uh, it is not a secret that Israel is a, um, militarily strong and uh, the direct threat uh, uh, to uh, Israel from uh, the opponents in uh, the region has lessened uh, substantially in the recent years, uh, and uh, the Israeli side has successfully avoided conflicts and large-scale wars during uh, the uh, recent decade. Also relevant, uh, if we are speaking about the region, is the topic of nuclear agreement that was signed uh, between uh, the major powers and uh, Iran in July 1915. And uh, has, uh, this agreement has postponed the materialization of Iran's nuclear potential. This is uh, of uh, importance uh, when we are discussing uh, present-day uh, situation uh, in the Middle East, also in the surroundings of Israel. Also, a very important factor uh, that is uh, somehow uh, forming uh, the situation all around the region is the conflict between the Sunni Arab world and uh, the uh, Shia radicalism. Uh, this is a struggle that uh, uh, is also uh, used uh, by uh, Israel to create some kind of platform of uh, communication and uh, uh, some shared interests between Israel and the Sunni Arab countries. Uh, last uh, but not least uh, are also uh, the important developments uh, created by energy discoveries uh, that uh, somehow bolster the Israel economy and are uh, also likely to improve uh, the relations uh, between uh, Israel and uh, the countries of uh, Central and Eastern Europe. I will not uh, direct my attention to the negative trends. Uh, if 
you are interested, we might uh, discuss them later. But I would like uh, now to go directly into uh, the current goals that Israel side uh, is expressing with regard to uh, the uh, Visegrad countries. It is uh, not a secret that uh, in a couple of days we will have uh, first time ever a uh, meeting uh, of uh, the prime ministers of the Visegrad country with uh, the Israeli prime minister and uh, I believe uh, that discussion of those issues is relevant uh, to the agenda that we have uh, on our today's meeting. So if we take uh, into consideration uh, the uh, uh, situation that in Israel enjoys uh, right now uh, on the international political uh, scene, uh, it is uh, uh, of Israeli, uh, uh, one of the Israeli priorities is uh, 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 to strive and to rebuild regional networks of alliances and uh, 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 cooperation that Israel enjoys. Uh, also, uh, considering the, the situation in the UN system. Uh, as uh, you probably know, Israel is now uh, striving uh, to uh, get rid of, uh, as uh, uh, the Israeli public and the Israeli authorities uh, believe, automatic anti-Israeli stance uh, at the UN. Uh, in order to uh, uh, achieve those goals, uh, the government of uh, Benjamin Netanyahu is uh, seeking to uh, consolidate its regional alliances with Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates and Egypt, as well as Jordan. Uh, and uh, here we are entering also uh, a new era that uh, Israel is enjoying uh, with uh, uh, the present US administration. In fact, uh, President Trump, uh, um, with his first uh, visit uh, and regional uh, tour to uh, Riyadh, uh, to Jerusalem, uh, express uh, uh, the American support for uh, this type of uh, uh, this type of contacts, as well as uh, uh, expressed uh, his uh, ambitions uh, to bring. Uh, peace between Israel and the Palestinians, however, with uh, an unconventional approach to traditional diplomatic uh, instruments. It is important uh, to note uh, this. Uh, what, what is uh, uh, preventing uh, right now uh, Israeli uh, side to achieve uh, those goals that uh, I just mentioned is uh, what the Israelis believe is the stance uh, uh, by the uh, European Union. Uh, Israeli side believes that uh, uh, the stance of uh, the EU and majority of its member states, uh, which unlike uh, the US, criticize Israeli settlements policy in the occupied territories, uh, and recognizes the emergence of the two states as the only possible conclusion of the peace process constitutes a kind of obstacle to the fulfillment of those uh, plans. And uh, according to the Israeli evaluation, uh, after uh, exit uh, uh, Brexit, uh, after exit of the Great Britain from uh, the EU, uh, those uh, trends uh, will uh, be uh, further strengthened uh, and uh, both uh, Berlin, Paris and Brussels will uh, seek to use the Middle East peace process as a tool to distance themselves from uh, the US Middle East policy. So what is the solution for uh, the uh, authorities in Jerusalem. 
in this situation, the Israeli uh, side is uh, trying to uh, establish more thorough, deeper relations with Eastern and uh, Southern uh, partners uh, from uh, Europe, namely with the Visegrad countries and uh, recently also with uh, Greece and uh, Cyprus. Uh, so, uh, if this is the stance, uh, uh, in the near future we should expect uh, uh, more extended uh, and deepened uh, uh, cooperation, uh, dialogue, political dialogue, and offers uh, from uh, the Israeli side to enhance cooperation with the Visegrad countries. Uh, the, the, the common, uh, the common uh, uh, forms of cooperation that uh, are right now uh, being discussed uh, are, as uh, already Larry mentioned, uh, spheres of uh, innovative industries, especially uh, exchange uh, in the uh, area of startups uh, and cybersecurity. Uh, those, uh, those areas will play important role in uh, uh, bringing closer uh, the countries, uh, the V4 countries and Israeli partners. Uh, another area of uh, convergent, convergent aims and goals is uh, Mm, the uh, cooperation against terrorism, anti-Semitism, and hate speech. This is something that uh, is uh, of interest uh, for both the Visegrad countries and uh, for Israel. I agree with uh, the previous statements uh, that historical issues may be problematic uh, in bilateral relations, but also uh, basing uh, uh, my evaluation, my assessment uh, on the, the long road, uh, the distance that we have already covered uh, in uh, uh, bilateral relations between uh, Poland and Israel as well as between other countries of Central Europe in Israel, I believe that uh, those uh, issues uh, not taking them off the agenda uh, will be uh, somehow uh, solved in uh, a friendly and uh, mutually understanding way. Uh, just just uh, to mention, uh, because I spoke now about uh, how Israel sees uh, the relations, I would like now uh, just to pinpoint what uh, are the interests and goals of uh, the Visegrad countries. The primary goal is uh, to force, as, as was mentioned, is to force the uh, closer cooperation between ecosystems of innovation and uh, high-tech sectors, as well as uh, uh, eagerness to develop uh, uh, mutually acceptable formula for exchange of experiences. And here we are speaking about uh, high-tech, startup, cybersecurity, all those uh, fields that uh, Israel, uh, as a startup nation, is uh, uh, very well uh, acquainted with and uh, considered to be uh, one of the major uh, success stories in the world. Also of common uh, interest by V4 countries uh, with uh, regard to uh, relations with Israel is to broaden uh, the understanding by the Israeli authorities uh, regarding uh, the allegation of inadequate satisfaction of restitution claims. This is something that uh, appears every now and then, every couple of years on uh, the agenda 
especially when we are uh, speaking about uh, contacts between uh, the Polish authorities, the, the Polish government and uh, the uh, organizations of uh, the Jewish diaspora in the United States. So we, we believe that uh, in contacts with uh, um, the Israeli authorities, we will be able to uh, find the more understanding uh, in regard to those issues. Also, uh, as was mentioned before, uh, Israel being uh, now uh, on the way of uh, becoming uh, an exporter of uh, uh, gas and uh, energy uh, is something of great interest uh, for the Polish side as well as uh, other countries in uh, Central and Eastern Europe uh, concerning the energy cooperation. Uh, we see that cooperation in this field with uh, Israel will create uh, special opportunities offered by natural gas resources uh, uh, natural gas resources uh, on the Israeli side. Uh, last but not least, uh, what is also of uh, interest, uh, not speaking about uh, the issues of national security, but this has something to do also with this, is common interest in mastering the current migration uh, crises. This is uh, where uh, both uh, interests of uh, the countries of Central Eastern Europe and of Israel meet. I believe I will uh, finish now and uh, give uh, opportunity for further discussions. Thank you. So. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I mean, I think that was uh, quite an extraordinary expose. Uh, in, a, in a very limited amount of time because I think you touched on, I would say, practically all the relevant issues and I'm hoping that we'll have an opportunity uh, a bit later to flesh some of them out. I would like just to uh, draw your attention um, to what I pointed out at the beginning, the difference between someone who is a practitioner of diplomacy and someone who is an analyst or observer, I couldn't help uh, but notice your description of the policy of the present administration in Washington. Uh, you called it an unconventional approach to traditional diplomacy. Uh, and I thought, what a diplomatic way of describing that, uh, so that's only to your credit. I would like just to say uh, two other uh, things, and one is when I mentioned earlier the issue of Poland's history policy as an irritant, I don't think that it will affect the overall positive ambiance of relations between Israel and Poland, but I do think it is a, it's, a, it's an irritant and by the way, I'm uh, glad that you raised the issue also of restitution. I had it also in my notes, but I didn't want to take too much time. Uh, I think that is also, it will be seen until such time as there is some resolution, however imperfect, because there cannot really be any perfect justice, that will also be a kind of lingering irritant. I don't believe, I agree as you do, that it will not, it will not um, dramatically affect the relationship between the two countries, but I think until such time as there is a resolution, it will always be an item on the agenda that will be consistently raised. And finally, about the gas and energy, uh, I must tell you, uh, in Israel, this is, of course, a very positive development. We used to always say, in Israel that it took Moses 40 years wandering in the Middle East to find the only piece of real estate in the neighborhood that had no oil and gas. So it turned out it did take him 40 years, but even he uh, didn't succeed and that there is oil and gas. And uh, it was discovered rather late in the game, but of course it's a very positive development. Well, now it's my very distinct uh, pleasure to introduce this gentleman who is sitting here to my right, Bogdan Zeloinski. A uh, couple of words from his uh, very long and impressive curriculum vitae. He is a former Polish ambassador to Canada, 
and historian specializing in Polish diplomacy. He is the author of a number of books. I will mention only two of his recent publications. One, The U.S. Ambassadors of Roosevelt to Moscow, and another, Ara and Diplomacy, The Return of Polish Treasures to Wawel. He is currently a professor of law at the University of Social Sciences and Humanities in Warsaw. I hope I've rendered the name of that uh, institution correctly. And on a personal note, as I said, I, I know all of these panelists for a long time. This gentleman, I don't want to tell you how many years I know, uh, but we're already uh, uh, in the fourth decade of our acquaintance. And I may say quite honestly that uh, were it probably, were it not for, for uh, this man's constant nurturing, uh, I doubt very much I would be sitting uh, on this panel, and I doubt very much that uh, I would be able to call myself an alumni of the history faculty of Warsaw University. So I won't say any more. I don't want to embarrass him any more than I've embarrassed the others. Uh, Bogdan, the floor is yours. Um, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, um, having opportunity to participate at, uh, in this panel discussion with uh, uh, such a prominent expert like uh, Ambassador uh, Agnieszka Misiak-Miszewska <coughs> and uh, Ambassador uh, Piotr Puchta, uh, I would like, you know, and of course I am not talking about Larry. That's, uh, nie przesadzajmy. Nie yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, I would like to change uh, my position. Uh, what I wanted to do, I wanted to present you questions and problems that interest a Polish student when they touch uh, problems of international relations. Because as Larry said, I am a teacher who teaches in two universities, exactly, in all this uh, economic university at Warsaw, Warsaw School of Economics, very long time, and this is quite a new institution which was founded uh, 25 years ago, a private university. They call it the um, Psych University of Psychology, Law, Journalism, and so, so on. Okay. Uh, uh, problem that students, in my opinion, are interested because I have, uh, how to say, everyday contacts with them. First one, naturally, is the national security, especially in context of the conflict between uh, Russia and Ukraine. Uh, they pay much uh, less attention to uh, not only Europe, but to other continents, I mean, Australia, Asia, and so, so on. That is very interesting, you know. And I want to emphasize that students think and recognize that the Russian aggression against the Ukraine became a very serious test uh, for European and global security system. It is a clear for a Polish student that the Russian action against Ukraine are undermining stability in many states of Baltic, Black Sea, and Caspian Sea origin. And really they are considered when Russia, and especially, you know, well-known president of Russia will, you know, prepare a new program for us. That's very interesting that they afraid very much. And in this context, uh, I must say, uh, most young student people in Poland don't exclude the possibility that Russia might expand its military aggression from Ukraine to other countries. Having uh, within seminars, I can hear always that only they right say to me that they see only one kind of a policy towards to them. I mean, to be tough, realistic, and, and, and stable in sympathy. I am not the expert on Russia, and uh, Ambassador Michalska can, you know, confirm is it true or not, is a good policy towards to a Kremlin or not. <laughs> no, that's yes, to be tough, absolutely. <laughs> they understand only the language of this, so I, I, will, I will answer you later. Second problem uh, that students like to discuss is the European Union, they like to speak about the European Union as an institution. They are very happy that we are a member of uh, uh, UN. That's not the 
question why Erasmus program, shortly speaking. But with another hand, they have not enough information about uh, what uh, Brussels is doing, I mean, every day. No, really. For them, they, they, they seem like a very, how to say, a bureaucratic institution with the, um, how to say, um, too many uh, administrators. Some of them, um, they present uh, very poorly for them. That's not the truth that they are making a lot of uh, jokes about some of them. So, that's a very interesting. I don't want to continue, but it's a problem for sure. Because, you know, some of them who present a, 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 a deep uh, knowledge of history try to uh, compare uh, Brussels to a League of Nations that <laughs> was a very nice institution, but not effective. No, I, this I am only repeating. I am not the saying as a true or not. But, you know, that's a very interesting. Uh, of course, um, uh, they are not what? <laughs> that's, that's just students, you know, were first, second uh, years of studies. That's very interesting. That's a quite new because I, you know, started with a history of a common law and so, so on. I am not the uh, presents you uh, views of this older you know, students who are finishing their study. That's a different story. Uh, problem that is a very interesting for them and particularly important is a problem of immigrants. You know, I ask them what they're thinking because they, they have a much more opportunity than I. They travel around Europe and they meet a lot of colleagues. And uh, I would like to uh, emphasize that undoubtedly young people have a positive attitude towards immigrants from Central and Eastern Europe, from Georgia, Armenia, and point. Uh, why? Uh, they think that our economy, our history, does not open easy adoption for uh, immigrants from uh, different regions, like uh, from Africa or, you know, uh, uh, Asiatic countries, I mean, from our way. That's their opinion. What else? Uh, in a student's opinion, our relation with the general Eastern European states are good. They are very happy. They like to go for, as, as shortly speaking, for beer to Vilnius, <laughs> to Tallinn, or <laughs> to uh, even Ukraine. That's not a problem for them, naturally. Uh, they are very happy with a new initiative of Polish government, I mean, FRISIS initiative, which in their eyes uh, gives, I don't know is it true or not, um, chance for better use of the, their resources I mean, both human as well as the uh, natural resources of uh, this country. You know, they, 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 I would like to remind you that they are students of uh, economy. There's a little bit of different. So they, 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 they analyze situation through economy. They don't you know, you know. And what else? Uh, naturally, I am very happy because uh, after 25 years, I see that we have a better type of students open to the world, shortly speaking. They love it. They are not, uh, you know, uh, afraid to travel to <laughs> every place in the world, <laughs> even to, you know, uh, North Polus and so, so on. So I don't want to bore you uh, longer. And my last word, Polish-Israel relation. I only want, um, how to say, emphasize that Israeli-Polish relation began to change for the better when Lawrence arrived to Poland, one of the first young Georgetown University student in 1983. And of course, I don't want to you know, say it loudly, he prepared a very special question for me. And I don't want to repeat what kind. They were very, you know, uh, provocative, uh, especially at the hours, you know, a meeting with a group of uh, students and he presented himself as a student of uh, Jan Karski, you know, was uh, a little bit, uh, how to say openly, danger for me to answer for his question. So I said that they have uh, some trouble with my voice and so, so on, because we were under full control. 
<laughs> you know, so Larry and uh, Madame and Mr. Ambassador, thank you very much for uh, your company and thank you. Well. Now, it, now, it, now it's my turn to be embarrassed because I've uh, caused everybody else on the panel that degree of uh, embarrassment. Um, before we open up the floor to questions, and uh, I would like to give uh, an opportunity for everybody present uh, to address their questions to the panelists, could I uh, ask all, all of you, what do you see now in the period that we are living in presently, which I think all of us would agree um, presents many, many uh, challenges. But what do you, the three of you, believe uh, are the most important challenges today uh, facing uh, uh, Poland and Israel to the extent that we can speak about them as having certain common interests, and I think we've established that they do have certain common interests. Um, particularly, uh, and this perhaps is best uh, addressed to Ambassador Magdzak Mishewska, what do you see are the challenges posed uh, particularly, um, well, we would say by the uh, rather expansive uh, policies, here I'm trying to borrow the diplomatic language <laughs> of my colleagues, the rather expansive uh, policies that we can see uh, being practiced in the East. Um, I can say, first of all, uh, as someone who lives in Israel, we are now in a rather new situation. For the first time, uh, we have uh, Russian uh, troops. It's not completely the first time because, of course, uh, there is a history of a Russian presence in the Middle East. And by the way, um, one of the members of the board of the Israel Council on Foreign Relations uh, is Ephraim Halevi, who was a former director of the Mossad, and he, as he always likes to remind people, he said that Russia is not an outsider in the Middle East. And Russia regards itself, uh, whether rightly or wrongly, and we could discuss that, as a very natural player in the Middle East. And when Russia projects its power in the Middle East, it doesn't feel like this is a kind of expeditionary uh, movement. It feels that this is its sort of natural backyard. And my question would be, what do you? What sort of challenges do you think we face, having a more dynamic uh, policy of Russia in this part of the world? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, you know, I think that uh, thanks to the policy of uh, predecessor of Mr. Trump, I mean, uh, Trump uh, Middle East policy of Mr. Barack Obama. Uh, Russia uh, found a place for itself, uh, but not only because of it, but uh, found a place to come back, to, to make a big comeback to the Middle East, uh, where uh, it used to be uh, being a partner and an ally of uh, Arab states. Yes, now the situation is something different because uh, uh, Russia uh, is trying to be a partner for almost every Arab country. Yes, uh, some years ago we witnessed uh, um, the attempts to uh, not replace, but uh, uh, to be a second choice uh, uh, for Egypt, for example as a supplier of uh, armaments, uh, economic uh, uh, cooperation, so on, so on. Um, for Israel, and it was very interesting, because uh, Israeli policy towards Russia is, I should say, very prag pragmatic and very realistic. There is no love, but there is great understanding that having as I said, one and a half million former, or not, not only Russian, but Soviet uh, citizens, uh, among them a big amount of the veterans of Red Army, yes. Uh, uh, it changes the, the, the environment. Uh, so 
having them, uh, a lot of them uh, preserving the close ties of Russia. Some of them are former dissidents or people who are uh, not lovers of the system, but sentiment of the country, of course. How big uh, this uh, um, part of uh, Israeli uh, sentiment towards uh, uh, their former countries, I uh, could uh, understand uh, in 2007 or 8, uh, riding uh, the car and uh, he, uh, listening to the uh, Israeli radio uh, in Russian language. And uh, for those, who, those of you who understand Russian, uh, I just heard uh, the advertisement. Same ulicy Ryuki na Rajdziestwo można pokupić niedaleko od Haifa. I mean, uh, the uh, best uh, Christmas trees for Christmas, uh, and I'm in the middle of Israel, yes, for Christmas, you can buy near Haifa market or something like this. Okay, this is one thing. So, having that my, uh, my, uh, minority, very important for Israel, and having Russia on its borders, Israel have to play very wisely, co uh, cooperating in, uh, with Russia uh, and uh, trying to minimize, uh, minimize uh, the, potential, the potential threats. As one of, the, uh, of our partners uh, from Ministry of Defense, uh, Amos Gilad, used to say, uh, Russia is okay because Russia behaves uh, better than uh, it uh, could to, to behave. Yes, so this is why Israel cooperates, for example, Israeli intelligence cooperates with Russia on uh, situation uh, in Syria. There are also a military cooperation, uh, which was uh, for us, in some moment very inconvenient. Uh, yes, with a message that we are cooperating, uh, for example, buying Israeli drones. Uh, we, haven't, we would like to be in a situation when, uh, when our Israeli drone fights uh, a Russian Israeli drone on our border. Uh, it would be a difficult situation, but that there is a big challenge for Israel, namely the Russia's policy towards Iran, supporting uh, Iran, not uh, military nuclear problem of this country, but uh, uh, with its um, uh, close cooperation also on the nuclear sphere. Now it's, of course, the peaceful nuclear uh, cooperation, but it can uh, easily change. Uh, with the uh, S-300 uh, uh, missile defense supplies uh, for Iran, which uh, have been stopped by the sanctions. And now the floor for the, those contracts is open. So uh, Russia could be a potential, uh, also create a very uh, big, uh, uh, big threat to Israel using uh, it's uh, the Iran's proxies like uh, Hezbollah uh, operating in Syria with the headquarter in Le uh, Lebanon and Hamas uh, on the other side uh, in Gaza and West Bank. So uh, this is how, ra how, how uh, difficult, uh, fragile and important is this Russian factor for the state of Israel. For, uh, and I should say that uh, I witnessed this very, uh, very realistic approach during uh, the consultations between uh, two ministries of foreign affairs, two ministries of defense, uh, and I didn't participate in the consultations of the um, intelligences, but this is something else. But, but I, I should say admi I admire this very um, calculated calculated pragmatic, pragmatic relations with this country, uh, which 
is a threat, of course, for for the, uh, the, the, the let's say the the country trying to to des de de destabilize the the order, not uh, only on our borders but uh, elsewhere in the world with, where it is possible and at and at the end, everybody know, especially countries like Israel, but also the global powers like uh, like United States, that without Russia, some problems are not possible to, to be solved. Uh, I only hope that uh, every partner dealing with Russia will not be too naive. Uh, I'm sorry, but I remember that, but I just... Uh, um, uh, um, would like to, to remember about the words of the tweet of Mr. Trump, who said that uh, he discussed with Mr. Putin, with Mr. Putin uh, the possible, or let's say, uh, not possible, but interference uh, of Russia in uh, American elections. And Mr. Putin said, uh, absolutely, uh, we didn't interfere, and if he said so, it's okay, and he said the truth. This is like Mr. Uh, Bush Jr. some years ago found uh, uh, the sincere democratic uh, approach in the eyes of Mr. Putin. So I would like only uh, to know that, that the, the leaders of this world are as pragmatic as Israel. A gentleman, would you like to comment? Yes. Uh, I would just like to add uh, three sh short remarks to what Agnieszka has mentioned here. Uh, first, I agree fully with uh, your statement that for Russia, uh, the Middle East is something uh, natural. Two examples. First, the Israeli parliament, Knesset, is positioned on a piece of land that is owned uh, by uh, the, the Russian government, as they say, uh, Church. Russian church, but uh, the Russians co are considering it, uh, and it is leased to, to the Israeli side uh, by the Russian church. So, kind of a symbol, you know, that the Israeli parliament is based on a land that is property of uh, uh, a Russian entity. Second, uh, my recent uh, visit uh, to Bethlehem, the cradle of Christianity, the biggest cultural center there was constructed by Russia, and uh, one of the main streets of uh, Bethlehem is named after Putin. This is kind of symbolic, but it's, it's also, it's also uh, gives us, you know, assessment what, what aims uh, Russia has when, uh, when uh, uh, they rediscover their presence in the Middle East. Second remark, if we take back the uh, last 70 years, the moment Russia has re-entered the Middle East, it never brought with uh, her presence stability. On the other hand, it brought wars, destruction, and suffering. And, and uh, my third remark, Russia is coming back to the Middle East not with something positive, not with a positive agenda, but with a symbol to counterbalance the presence of the United States. So I believe that this is something that we should take into consideration when evaluating the Russian presence uh, in the Middle East nowadays. And by the way, uh, the, the parts of uh, my statement that I omitted were to do with the Russian presence in the Middle East. Uh, I have only one, you know, uh, and short uh, suggestion for them, I mean, from, for Kreml. They should pay more attention to Siberia. It's also interesting region for them. I am not. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. That's my advice and good from. Uh, I, permit me. I just say a couple of things. Uh, first of all, 
I think with respect to our parliament, which is undoubtedly on leased land, I think it uh, belongs to the Orthodox Church, but I think it's actually the Greek Orthodox Church that owns the land under which the parliament is built, but we could speak about that uh, another time. Uh, I don't know, some of you are familiar perhaps with the great Orientalist Bernard Lewis, uh, who is a, uh, really one of the outstanding figures in Middle Eastern studies. He once came to Israel and we had him as our guest and he had spent a lot of time in Egypt and he recounted the following story. He said, I think it was in the 1950s or 60s, he was in Egypt at a time when the Soviet presence was very formidable and Soviet influence was very great. And he asked an Egyptian and he, what this guy thought. He said, can you tell me what is the difference between the Soviet presence in Egypt and the British presence in Egypt. The British had only recently left the country. The man said, well, you know, both of them look at Egypt like a cow. Only the British want milk and the Soviets want beef. So that you can say with respect to what uh, the Soviet or now Russian aspirations in the Middle East. It's my pleasure now to open the floor to this audience. So I would only ask uh, whoever would like to pose a question that it really be a question. Uh, and at least my experience in Israel, nobody ever asked a question. They only gave a, a speech. And at the end, they said, well, now we put the question mark. And if you would uh, be kind enough just to identify yourself and uh, tell us what uh, your institutional affiliation is, if anything. I think we have half an hour, sir. Good afternoon, Michal Wojnarowicz, Polish Institute of International Affairs. Uh, I have one question, one and two questions about the future, about the Polish-Israeli relations. Uh, in regard to the Polish uh, non-permanent member in the Security Council of the United Nations, uh, will it help relations with Israel or will it cause some turbulence, in your opinion? And the second, uh, is for Israel the new Three C's initiative, an interesting, three, the Three C's initiative. Uh, will, will be it an uh, interesting partner or is it too vague for now to decide? Sir, I, I'm terribly sorry. I don't think I understood. I didn't hear properly the, the second part of your question. You're right. Is it too late for Israel to... to uh, what kind of project? The Three Seas project? Yeah. Uh, will there be... Will the Israel will be interested in it? First of all, would uh, you like to address the, 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 the first question, which was about uh, the United Nations? Uh, yes, thank you for giving me the floor. Uh, before answering this question, I would just uh, like... Uh, to, to go back to uh, the, the issue of lack of information about the EU among uh, students in Poland, this is something that we are also experiencing uh, in uh, the relations between EU and Israel. Uh, if, if you take into uh, consideration the image that the EU has in Israel, uh, to a large extent, according to my understanding, uh, the cause of this is uh, just lack of information and this is something that uh, the EU really needs uh, to put more effort into. Uh, so we're, we're not trying to evade your question, no, 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 we'll, no. we'll get to it in a second. But this is something important if, if we are to understand you know, what, what is going on between Poland, Israel, the EU, the lack of information what uh, the Euro European Union is doing uh, uh, for Israel, uh, accepting Israel as a partner in Horizon, for instance, yes. Horizon 2020 and... You, you're uh, absolutely correct about that. And, so uh, so you, the lack correct. of information is not only here, yeah, but no, also... This I can say, and I, from my own experience, and uh, having had an ongoing relationship with the European Union representative office in Israel, uh, to be the European Union uh, representative, ambassador of the European Union, is was a very difficult uh, job. There is tremendous, well, I would say, mistrust uh, in Israel 
uh, of the European Union. Not all of it, I must say, is unfounded, but there isn't really a tremendous understanding, at least among the common citizen, about what the EU stands for. But I will tell you also, that's a two-way street. If you speak to citizens of European Union countries, particularly in the western part of the continent, there's also a tremendous misunderstanding of Israel. According to many popular opinion polls, uh, Israel ranks uh, roughly around uh, North Korea uh, and several other states which are not known uh, to be in the vanguard uh, of progressive uh, humanity. So it, it, it's something that really needs to be worked on. But sir, let's get back to your question. I apologize if we've made okay. this digression. Now, uh, cons concerning this, the second question, uh, the uh, Israeli interest vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, uh, uh, the idea of the uh, uh, Adriatic Baltic and, uh, and the, the, um, uh, the Black Sea, uh, it's obvious for us that uh, Israel is very much interested in this idea. We had already uh, uh, consultation on the level of uh, directors of relevant uh, foreign uh, office departments on this issue. And uh, I believe uh, it's only uh, opening for contacts between Israel and various partners uh, that uh, are uh, involved in uh, the Free Seas project. So my answer is yes. Concerning the, the Polish uh, membership in the Security Council, uh, of course, it will, uh, to a large extent, depend how Polish uh, uh, foreign policy and diplomacy is, is playing this. this. And uh, here, uh, being uh, a member in the Security Council, we have uh, a very, very uh, specific role. Uh, knowing the uh, special relations between uh, Poland uh, and Israel, but also taking into consideration uh, our very good relations with uh, many other countries in the region, we believe that uh, we can be a very uh, important uh, factor in uh, creating atmosphere favorable for some kind of uh, new initiatives, new ideas, uh, also taking into consideration those uh, unconventional ideas that were already mentioned a couple of months ago in Jerusalem. If I may add um, uh, uh, to this uh, um, United Nations uh, Security Council position. I should say that uh, attitude towards United Nations in Israel is very interesting because Israel is an object of, uh, let's say, uh, coordinated, uh, not hatred campaign, but but if you take into account, if you will count the anti-Israeli resolutions um, of different uh, UN agenda, agendas, uh, you might, uh, as uh, you just said, you might uh, think that, uh, that Israel is something worse than North Korean regime or uh, the, the most um, anti-democratic, racist, and uh, no kind of upper, apartheid is. Uh, so Israelis have no uh, uh, good feelings towards uh, this institution. But on the other hand, they are very sensitive uh, uh, what is happening towards uh, Israel uh, in UN. So, the voting in different agendas uh, of this institution are uh, closely followed by Israeli uh, press, by uh, Israeli public opinion. And, for example, uh, what was very well, or, very, or what was welcomed from the uh, from um, uh, the Polish position was that we uh, opposed and didn't uh, 
uh, take part in a so-called Durban 1, Durban, uh, Durban 2, that Poland rejected a uh, Goldstone report uh, on Castlet uh, operation, and so on, so on. So uh, that was very, uh, this is very important for Israel, which country uh, votes uh, how on different issues. Yes, uh, so in this, uh, in this uh, context, uh, abstaining uh, on some, uh, some um, last UNESCO executive committee um, uh, uh, session uh, was, uh, 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 let's say, received with some question mark in Israel and especially we haven't been in the executive UNESCO committee when the uh, when the Temple Mount uh, was uh, voted uh, and uh, it's okay for us because I'm afraid that we will abstain once again uh, but uh, Hebron as a that was that was a secret voting, but but I I think knowing that three states were against the resolution, uh, and uh, resolution of an excavation in Jerusalem, uh, when we abstained, uh, so this is very important and it's counted on the list, uh, and it's important for bilateral relations, even if the institution is distrusted. I think uh, I can certainly subscribe to uh, what Ambassador Magjak Mishevska has said. I think that's quite a realistic assessment uh, of how Israelis look at the United Nations. Uh, our uh, first Prime Minister Ben Gurion once said, uh, UN, Shmuen, not something we really need to pay attention to, but uh, that was, of course, a very simplistic attitude in retrospect and Israelis do follow very keenly how individual states vote but uh, we recognize um, that for a variety of reasons there is an automatic majority against Israel but the expectation is that the countries which are seen as part of the Western world uh, democratic countries uh, should throw their support toward Israel at least in certain uh, votes that are really egregious or outrageous um, and that isn't always the case. So there is a, a certain level of, uh, well, we'll call it disappointment. Ladies and gentlemen, we have another half an hour, so we're happy to entertain questions. How much time do we have? The food or shoes? The food or shoes? The Sir, Professor Mitzkel, do we have until 6 o'clock or do we have until 5.30? As much time as we want. That's, we're actually wait, we're actually waiting for someone to come. We're waiting for someone to come around with the, with the drinks. You know, um, there's time for a few other questions. I hope so. Yes, sir, Professor Mitzkel. Within just a few years, Poland's newest, oldest frigate will be launched in the Baltic. And the fact that in a few more years, Poland will expect three new uh, submarines. Is there any truth to the fact that Poland will be building a base in the Mediterranean in Israel? Uh, not that I've heard of, but I don't claim to be the best informed person on these matters. So I am afraid uh, I cannot answer that with any real certitude. Mediterranean is not a part of free seas. No. Not yet, at any rate. It may not expand. Yet. Ladies and gentlemen, sir. Uh, hello, my name is Vitaly Yermolenko. I'm, uh, I'm a student at the at University of Warsaw. And my question will uh, actually is to Ambassador Mishevska. Uh, how would you, uh, how would you uh, actually, what's your perspective on contacts between Russian top officials and Hamas uh, leadership? And uh, actually, what's your opinion on contacts between Russian top officials and Hamas uh, leadership? And do you think uh, the Russia 
could ever manage to avoid any recruitment of uh, its uh, citizenship, uh, citizens uh, to the ISIS, uh, ISIS uh, military groups and the recruitment of uh, citizens from uh, Central Asia countries uh, which, uh, which are mainly allies within um, CSTO. Thank you. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, I don't uh, hurt. Uh, Larry, you can uh, elaborate. Uh, do, you, do you know about the uh, contacts between Russia and Hamas during last two years? Because there were contacts between Russia and Hamas. Uh, Hamas leaders uh, were uh, uh, welcomed uh, in, uh, in Russia. But that was some years ago. Uh, I don't know, like uh, eight, seven years ago. I don't know uh, nothing about uh, close contacts uh, between Hamas and Russia. This is, uh, but of course, uh, as Piotr just said, uh, Russia is not coming back to the Middle East to bring stabilization and peace. And this is obvious. When it's possible, it is possible to divide. When it's possible uh, to uh, create uh, a crisis, uh, Russia will be present. This is first thing. Uh, and I don't, I don't believe that uh, Hamas today is really a big threat to Israel. I don't, uh, I don't believe it. I, um, uh, I think that there are uh, threats, that there are possible threats from inside. I mean about, uh, I mean the radicalization of uh, Israeli Muslim citizens. Uh, and uh, uh, we know about the um, recruitment uh, by Daesh uh, uh, also Israeli Arab citizens. This is, this is the most, this is the, the, the bigger threat now. Uh, and the Hezbollah is also much, uh, much uh, serious player uh, than Hamas uh, today. Uh, and uh, recruitment of Russian citizens uh, yes, of course, we know about uh, uh, especially the, uh, the people of the uh, previous, uh, previous Chechen, uh, Chechen regime uh, who are, mm, who are uh, active uh, uh, in Syria and Iraq. We know about the recruitment uh, in uh, Muslim rep republics, of course. Yes, of course. The, 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 let's say, the um, imams uh, are, uh, are very active, Dagestan, in Dagestan, you know, said, uh, yes, 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 yes. Uh, just one remark, uh, not basing my statement on any specific information, uh, for Russia relations with uh, the Hamas uh, are somehow uh, problematic because, uh, as you know, uh, since the so-called Arab Spring, they have very negative attitude towards the Muslim Brotherhood. And uh, Hamas uh, is, uh, well, formally they, they said that they, they, they dissociated themselves, but knowing the history of Hamas, knowing how it was created and how uh, it uh, gained momentum on uh, the Palestinian side, uh, it will be very difficult to, to dissociate themselves completely from the Muslim Brotherhood. So, on the one hand, Russia is uh, having contacts with them. On the other hand, uh, because of uh, the Russian attitude towards the Muslim Brotherhood, those contacts, I would say, nowadays uh, are quite problematic. Yeah, I would only add there are, of course, all kinds of contradictions in this uh matter sometimes uh, these relationships are, are very uh, i mean they're seemingly I illogical and uh, again 
take into consideration also whatever ties there are between Hamas and Iran as well. So it's a quite complicated, quite complicated uh, picture. But I certainly agree with uh, Agnieszka that the potential for some kind of a radicalization among Israeli citizens who are, who are Arabs and are increasingly identifying themselves also as Palestinians uh, is something that cannot be, cannot be taken lightly and is something that uh, uh, is a matter of tremendous concern uh, to Israel. No more questions? Yes, madam. Thank you. Uh, my name is Laura Gheorghiu. Um, I'm actually a PhD student in Graz, but I'm asking you as a CEU alumna. CEU meaning Central European University Budapest. Uh, as you know, perhaps, uh, the present government of uh, uh, Hungary tries to uh, close it up. And very, so, we've, so we've heard. Very recently, Israel announced that uh, it supports uh, Orban Victor against uh, George Soros. How would you comment on that? Well, perhaps I should be the one to answer that uh, and spare my colleagues that pleasure. Um, the situation is as follows, and we're speaking about something that's unfolding even as we speak. Um, Israel expressed concern that the campaign being, posed, being waged at the present by the Hungarian authorities targeting uh, Soros was really going to incite anti-Semitism among the Hungarian public. And I don't think there's a great argument uh, about that because a lot of the posters that were put in various parts of Budapest, whether in uh, streetcars or uh, other public places, were defaced with anti-Jewish graffiti and Soros is widely understood uh, in Hungary to be a figure of Jewish origin. On the other hand, uh, and so Israel did make a formal protest, but on the other hand, and again, we can take issue whether this was a wise policy uh, or not, Israel also had no love for Soros and uh, made clear that they also don't look with great favor on Soros because he is a very, consistent critic uh, of Israeli policies. And so therefore, again, we could discuss whether Israel behaved as it should, what should have been the proper response. Uh, but yes, there is this, we'll call it the contradiction, that on the one hand, uh, it, it did say that this is some kind of incitement to uh, the worst traditions in Hungarian society. And on the other hand, it said, well, just there shouldn't be any misunderstanding. We don't like we don't like uh, Soros, and this is, a, this is the official Israeli, Israeli position. And by the way, it's not to the extent that people in Israel are following events in Hungary, and uh, again, this relates to what uh, Bogdan said, I mean, the public knowledge is not very great, but to the extent that anybody really follows what's happening in Hungary, and those are people really who are a little bit involved, interested in foreign policy, or people of Hungarian origin who are, of course, paying attention uh, to events in Hungary, there's a lot of discussion, uh, and there has been the suggestion that this was, this was not what Israel should have done. Uh, so be, be, be clear, there's a lot of criticism within Israel, and by the way, it should be made clear when we speak about what Israel is doing or not doing, Israel's acts of commission or omission, Israel, for better or worse, is a country where everybody feels they know better. There's a lot of discussion, there's a lot of uh, criticism waged of, uh, within the country about official policies, so this is something one has to take into consideration. And one could say that's perhaps uh, one of Israel's strengths. It's, it's, what, it's what distinguishes Israel from the countries in the neighborhood, that there, it is really a, a, a democracy. Is it a perfect democracy? I don't think such a thing exists, but it is certainly a democracy. Are there any other questions? Well, ladies and gentlemen, before I, I, I let you all go, you know, I was once told uh, by a wise teacher of mine, 
never uh, let your audience leave without telling them something funny and never begin your session without telling them funny. And I was thinking as we were having this, well, what could I say at the end? And all this discussion about Russia reminded me of a famous story. Well, we spoke about 1967 as being a watershed uh, point in the history of Israel and certainly in the history of Israel's relations with uh, Central Europe because most of the countries of Central Europe severed relations with Israel in the wake of the Six Day War, except for Romania. And within uh, Poland, though, there was quite a lot of admiration for Israel's, well, very unexpected and very dramatic triumph uh, against Arab countries surrounding Israel, which were very heavily armed. And there was a lot of discussion, how was it possible for Israel to triumph over all these countries, particularly uh, Egypt, which had received a lot of uh, armaments from Russia and as well as, the, as, well as Syria. Uh, and also, uh, they had very intense military cooperation. So finally, someone said, well, it's very easy to understand how Israel overcame these enemies because all of the officers from these Arab countries, in particular Egypt and Syria, had all been sent to the Soviet Union, uh, to Soviet military academies to learn Soviet doctrine, military doctrine. And so when they came back to their countries, of course, they were imbued with uh, th what they had learned. And so what happened in 1967, the war erupted in the Sinai Peninsula. The Egyptians withdrew to their second line of defense and then waited for the snow. So this is how you can understand uh, what happened. There. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your attention. But above all, thank you very much to our panelists. A great pleasure.